Hi, good morning. Welcome to the February edition of the Full Bay Shop Owner Roundtable. Chris, it's February. It is Can February. you believe it? <laughs> it doesn't feel like it. I I'm know. Jacket. Yeah. <laughs> Trying to participate. It's unbelievable. <laughs> First one of 2024. So last slide before we get started, the standard disclaimer. I think the lawyers are happy now, um, but we're going to offer a lot of opinions. Make sure that you consult with your own advisors for you know, how to best implement those given your specific situation. And with that, and the exciting part, we'll welcome our guest, Peter Cooper. Thank you very much for joining us. Thanks for having me. All right. From Merck's Truck and Trailer, um, down from Iowa. Correct. How are you enjoying Phoenix? It's lovely. Yeah. <laughs> It's a great place to visit in February. Better than the weather here last week, apparently. All right. Well, before we get into questions for you, maybe you can just take a minute and kind of introduce yourself to the audience, a little history of how you made your way to Merck's. So my background is uh, 24 years in the industry. Uh, I started off uh, working on a farm. I grew up on a farm, so everything and anything that broke, I had to work on it. Um, 2014, I started uh, Absolute Repair. And then in 2023, we merged with Merck's Truck and Trailer, and now we're uh, six stores in, in three states, and um, I'm the director of operations for all six stores. Awesome. So that, that experience of being an owner of a shop you know, will be really important for the audience. And then as you know, running operations for a, multi, uh, a multi-location entity, and it gives you a lot of experience. So. It is. There's quite a variety uh, from you know being a service tech and a service truck and start from scratch and building, you know, building it up from a gravel parking lot to, you know, what we've built today. So it's, I've had about every position there is in the business. Yeah. Can you tell us a little bit more about, you know, the type of business you guys typically uh, conduct in the shops? You mainly heavy duty mix of so medium. So each store has its own uniqueness uh, based on uh, the area and what that area needs. Uh, but we're mostly heavy duty truck uh, over the road trucks uh, and, in our Illinois locations, and then our Texas location is almost 100% medium duty. So they're working on the F450s, 550s, uh, and then we do have two uh, stores that have body shops. That that's a main component of what they do. Interesting. All right. Well, we have you know, a number of questions that people have pre-submitted, some topics we've previewed with you. You don't have all the answers yet, but... Um, <clears throat> We'll go through and, and start with these. And again, for the audience, please send in any questions that you want us to address. I think we have a good list of probably 30 or 40 backup questions as well from people prior to uh, us getting started. So maybe we'll get started first with the, the topic of just scheduling in the shop. Right? Everybody has problems with this. How do we... Scheduling do we, is the 800-pound gorilla in the room when you're talking to shops. And, and how do you stay on, on topic or on task? I think it starts with workflow. You know, you have to document your workflow and you have to document your process because if you don't know what you do and how you do it, how do you know how long it takes? That's a huge part of it. And I think another big key to that is when a truck rolls in, you have no idea what's wrong with it. You don't know what's wrong with it. You don't know what parts are going to take to fix it. You don't know availability of parts. So really, you know, our key is you have to, the only thing you can promise a customer is, is that this is when we're going to diagnose it. And if you know, you have to go from there because you never know when it rolls in what the job's going to be. And uh, you have to be able to articulate it to your customers and your employees about this is our process. This is how we're going to do things. This is how long things take. This is what our promise is to the customer. Are, are you scheduling like two and three weeks out to kind of forecast out a 30-day period or a period of time? Or is it just people are showing up and you're dealing with breakdowns? As There's a variety are. of both. So we just started a, uh, a an express to set program at one of our stores where we try to have hands on a truck within two hours of it showing up. And so that's a pilot program we're, we're starting. Um, but it really depends on the store. Like our body shop, there's some of their stuff they're doing. They're six months out. Right, right. Depending on the, the size of the job. So there's a huge variety. And and that's the, the part that's hard with scheduling is, is how much do you schedule doing tire repairs? Well, you really don't. But you do schedule doing big jobs like engine overhauls. So there's a huge blend in there. And you have to kind of have... Uh, the ability to look at both. Now, do you stagger that out? Earlier, we were talking about engine overhauls. You could have like three in frames going on or three f- major repairs. Do you do them all on the same week or the same day? Or how do you plan that out? That's a huge part of it is balance, right? Like you you have to balance everything in business. You have to balance your workforce and you have to balance your jobs. So it's key not to do things like do three engine overhauls if you have six techs because now you've tied up half your techs doing big jobs that probably aren't going to close this week. 
And then that gets into, you know, your finance side of things. You end up in a boom and bust cycle because you have one week with no revenue and the next week you're just knocking it out of the park. And so that all has to be a consideration when you run a schedule is what's the week going to look like financially and what are your goals? Some people think if you don't take all three engine overhauls, you're going to lose the business or you have to sub it out because, you know, you, it's, you urgently got to get this done. Is that uh, how do you manage that or manage those customer expectations? Well, that's exactly it. That's the phrase we use exactly is managing expectations. But I think a lot of store managers and owners have to understand your customers aren't there because you're the cheapest guy in town. And usually they're there because they know who you are. They know that what you do. I mean, it's the same reason people buy Mercedes, right? Not everybody goes out and buys a Chevy Cavalier because it's cheap. I mean, they buy a Mercedes because they, you know, it's worth it to them. So the fear that you turn someone away, you know, and say, we can't do it right now. I, you know, I haven't found that that really is as bad as people think it is. Reputation, quality stands for right. itself. Right. I mean, if you're a quality shop and you're not trying to be a discount shop, people are going to come for the quality. They're going to wait. You know, you have to be reasonable and you have to be able to tell people it's going to be this. This is when we're going to do it because people want that. They want that expectation of this is the day we're going to work on your truck. Is there a balance then? Do you have like 30 percent of the uh, hours in a week are for preventive maintenance? You know, X percent is for major repairs or and how do you budget that through the week? It's about, uh, you know, we try to do about a 20 percent on each. So 20 percent maintenance, 20 percent that we have a person that can be able to do those those roll-in jobs or jobs that call in and have a flat tire and want to get that fixed today or at least to have something diagnosed, yes. But then there's a couple of techs that are tied up doing big jobs all okay. the time. Also, well, you mentioned process. I know you have a, a good process map. Um, mind if we right. share that to everybody? You can. And have you, and that's have part you walk of, us through? That's part of what we call managing customer expectations. So if you can articulate to a customer, this is what our process is going to be, right? The truck's going to come in. We're going to diagnose it. When we diagnose it, we can tell you this is what it's going to need for parts. This is how long it's going to take to do the repair. And this is when we can have the parts. Because that's a huge thing still in the industry is when am I going to have the parts to fix it? And so the ability to, to not only have all the employees on the same page with that, but also customers, it really helps smooth that out with the schedule. Because then they understand, look, it, this is a process, right? We're not just showing up and digging into this thing. We have to walk through it and figure it out. And how much of that do you share with the customer? I mean, w would they actually have some visibility <laughs> into all of these you know, 10, 10, 11 steps? It is. So we have those that's published at every store. Uh, we share it with customers. Every employee has a copy of it on their toolbox uh, or at their workstation. And it's, it's pretty widely spread uh, to the customers and to the employees. So everybody's on that same page. What, what are you seeing for like lead times on, on parts? You, you mentioned that just a few minutes ago. Is that a big deal still where you'll get jobs tied up that should have been done this week that carry over to next week? It is still an issue. Uh, usually it's more to do with um, either you got the wrong part or somebody didn't know that this was going to break or and now we're waiting another three days. You could, The parts are available. It's just not like it was pre-COVID where the parts were you could have them today. And it does right. depend on your, your region and where you're at. Like we have a store in Chicago. It seems like they have everything in 10 minutes. And other stores, like we have one in a little town in Iowa that it takes a couple of days to get it. Now, is that on the OE side or aftermarket or both? Both. Oh, okay, both. both. Okay. Interesting. Yeah. Well, as we're talking about scheduling, and you know, that kind of goes naturally into you know, how do you get people to do more efficiency, productivity, can you talk a little bit about how, you, how you're incentivizing techs, measuring them, and holding them accountable? Well, the best way to do it is pay, pay flat rate if you can get by with it. But yeah. unfortunately, that's not what employees want. So uh, the first thing is, is really making sure technicians know their numbers, right? I mean, using full bay, it's right in their face. Every day at their dashboard, they know what their billings are. They know how much they've billed. They know how many hours they have clocked. So it's right there. And getting them to know that, because whatever is measured grows. And then we use a hybrid pay scale uh, at most of our stores where we're doing, uh, we're doing hourly plus bonus. So they have certain benchmarks of build hours they hit, then they get a bonus per hour uh, on that pay check. Do you, we just had some folks on another webinar that uh, a few ago that said flat rate was the way to go. Do you find that it's, it's, it's one way or the other, or is that something that uh, some regions can support flat rate? Well, theoretically, flat rate is the best way to go, especially for the business owner. Uh, unfortunately, there are certain regions that you just can't seem to get guys on board with that. 
Uh, we see that more in the, you know, your bigger metropolitan areas. They don't seem to go for that as much. Um, and it kind of depends on the store itself. I mean, it's a hard switch, but if you start getting a reputation where these guys are making big money, then people believe in it. Cause you got to understand it's a big leap of faith when a guy goes from one employer to another, like it's, they're hoping they're going to, you're going to be able to feed them with enough work and they're going to stay busy. So flat rate is kind of, it's kind of scary for a lot of guys. I've heard some people making, you know, greater than six figures. There was reports of, you know, 120, 150,000 because the, basically the guy was writing his own check. He could, as fast as he right. could perform and the work was there, it, uh, it worked out re really well. But, um, it sounds like if it's, uh, it's conditional based on the shop or the type of repair, or is it more regional? It's more regional what the market will bear. I mean, we would love to have flat rate in every store. Um, but unfortunately, like I mentioned, there's that, uh, that fear factor when you're hiring a new person, if there's no safety net there, if there's no guarantee hourly wage or right. something like that. They just get very, they don't feel well about it. And unfortunately, more and more as you dive into it, it's not necessarily the technician. See, when you hire someone, it's not, you're not just hiring the tech, you're hiring the family and what's behind it. Because if their wife or their significant other is not behind what they're doing, they don't believe in it, then it's harder for them to believe in it. So you have to have something there that, you know, can assure people they have a wage. Are you doing things to include the family, like doing outings or get togethers where you bring family members to the shop or social events? Uh, we do. Uh, we do, you know, some uh, a Christmas party that we bring in significant others, but we do bring in that at sometimes in the interview process. Like I've called spouses and talked to them and been like, Hey, is this really what, you know, do you understand this? Do you have questions for us? Is there anything that we can, you know, we'll bring them in sometimes. And, and my wife and I, you know, when we had our own store, we would take them to dinner and sit them down and talk to them. Cause it is, it's a lifestyle change. You know, it's a huge thing to change employment. We had a question somewhat related to that, just specifically around uh, bonus plans, incentive programs. How pervasive are those in your shop? Every technician at the individual level, at the team level or shop level? It is store specific. Uh, we'll use the store that I started, for example. Every single person in that building has a number. They know what their sales goals are. They know how many trucks per week they need to turn. They know what the average work order is. The technicians are intricately involved in, uh, in that process. They help estimate jobs. Uh, we're in the Rust Belt, right? So flat mm -hmm. rate doesn't exist. I mean, something that's supposed to take 10 hours takes 20 because of a broken bolt, right? So things like that. It, it's key that the technician gives us input. But yes, every single person there is on a bonus program. Is there a safety element to it or is it just purely performance or comebacks and it's purely performance and comebacks. I mean, we've done a pretty good job at, at knocking down the safety side of it. You know, if you hurt yourself, you're not working, so you're not making money. I mean, it's a pretty, you know, yeah, it's not a good thing for people to be getting hurt. Makes sense. All right. Well, this is always a question right? as everyone's looking to really get more business into their shop until I know I'm going to switch gears totally here and we can come back to some of the, the efficiency and optimization pieces, but marketing in general. So you have shops in different locations, all, not all, but some do different types of work. Can you talk a little bit about how you go about marketing your shops um, and how that differs maybe by region or by type of work they're doing? So we're currently using uh, Dieselmatics to help us with the, the internet side of it, the pay-per-click and the, the, social media side, it just became its own animal. It's just too much to run for one person. E even when we had our, you know, when I ran my store by myself that I had and we started, I couldn't do it by myself, right? Like I have a theory on things. If it's not your genius, hire someone else to do it, right? And internet marketing is not my genius. I was a shop owner. I was a mechanic by trade. Um, but lately, the biggest thing for us has been geotargeting. We've really gotten into that this year where we're targeting certain things. Like for example, we do a lot of road service. So we've targeted like truck stop parking lots, for example. So if you're sitting in that truck stop parking lot and you're looking for our service, we're specifically, you know, broadcasting or, or paying for those ads for that individual versus in, in excluding other areas that aren't our target market. That makes sense. Very strategic. Yeah. Do you, you know, when we were talking earlier about uh, just uh, Q4 and uh, Q1 performance, you had made a reference to um, you know, the, the weather having an impact and seasonality. Um, some people think that there's a downturn in the market, 
but you had a different uh, um, perspective on it that I thought maybe you could share that. Well, markets are, are cyclical, and sometimes the cycle goes with seasons. And in the Midwest, where a bunch of our stores are, you have very distinct seasons. And so we always see a drop in uh, breakdowns anytime that there's temperate weather. When it's 70 degrees and sunny, things don't break. And, and where we're at in the Midwest, they break when it's 20 below zero and the wind's blowing. And so, you know, you have to watch those trends and be available to maximize it. You know, if you know that stuff is coming, you can prepare for it. And you referenced that this is a mild winter for you. So. It has been in the Midwest. I mean, quarter four was super mild. I mean, it was 50 degrees and sunny on Christmas Day. And that's not normal for Iowa and, and Chicago area. So, but then we had a huge cold snap right after the first of the year. And, you know, the temperatures were 15 below zero. So it does vary based on that for the breakdown side of things. But that goes back to the schedule and your, and, and your balance. If you've scheduled right, you shouldn't be sorry that you're two weeks out because you've done what you need to do as a business owner to guarantee that your techs have enough work so that they can bonus so that when you go to hire more techs, everybody in town knows these guys are making money. There's always enough work for these guys to do. It's kind of a whole package, you know, when you're trying to do these things with hiring and scheduling, you have to think about all the parts and how they fit together. And on the marketing side, like tying that all back to marketing, are you doing marketing to, you know, private fleets outside of just the, the truck stop areas, promoting preventative maintenance or maintaining equipment, right. et cetera? So we're doing a combination of that. Pay-per-click is just part of it. Uh, we've also got a, a database called RigDig that we use where we can actually physically go out. And you can dive RigDig all the way down to, I want to only look at fleets within five miles of this store and only fleets that have Volvos. You can get that specific. You can get as specific as it will show you the VIN number of the truck that, that fleet has. Okay. Because all the stuff is open source information that vehicle is registered. So that is another tool that we use to dive into certain size. We have a targeted fleet size that we're trying to target. Okay. So we know what our demographic is. And so we're going out and actively finding those fleets and then marketing to them specifically. So you do direct marketing and will you put the sales team on it? And Correct. It, but, okay, double down. Oh. Yeah. Like I think uh, this year we came out with... Uh, and it's super inexpensive. We went out and got these plastic jars and filled them with Jolly Ranchers and put a sticker on it. I mean, we're like two, three dollars a jar, and who doesn't like that? Yeah. You know, you just go like we've got one of them. We got a Penske facility that's right down the street from our store. They take them donuts every week. Eventually, they're going to need us for something. We hope. Yeah. Uh, but people have to understand marketing is is kind of a two fold approach. It's it's like it's kind of like your money. You know, you, you you've got so much set aside that you're investing for the future, and then you've got stuff you're using today. And that's kind of what marketing has to be, at least in my mind, is. You've got marketing that you're doing in, in the future. It's an investment to hope for the future. You're building that that funnel, that feed of customers that you may not get a, a, a response from today. Yeah, building that brand awareness, I think, is it's tough for some people to buy into because they don't see the immediate. I spent all this money on you know the donuts, and then I got you know a contract two weeks later. But right. It's going to take a long time for that to build up, and then you're top of mind when they need something. Well, and that's key to shop owners and, and shop managers. They have to have that mindset of, I have a plan, this is the plan, and it's going to work. And you have to see it through. I mean, some of these things, this marketing, you know, it's an investment. It may be a year or two before you see that return because you may have, you know, for example, you may go stop by a fleet and the guy just leased 10 new trucks. Yeah. And he's not going to need you today, but he's going to need you someday. And you have to just keep fostering that relationship you know, relationships are something that you can't wait until you need it to have it. It's kind of like going to the bank. You don't want to go to the bank when you're broke. Go to the <laughs> bank when you don't need the money. And it's the same way with relationships and marketing. You, you know, you need to market even when you don't need it because you have to worry about tomorrow. Now, are you doing pro sales promotions or marketing promotions where you're doing mass emails out to folks with coupons or? I, I'm not a big fan of coupons. I'm not a real big fan of discounting stuff. I mean, I get it if you're sitting on, you know, three or four pallets of tires you need to move, you know, that's something different. But to discount your product and devalue it, it's, it's a very slippery slope. Uh, it's not a big part of what we believe in in marketing. And how do, do you guys think of marketing at all when you, when you think of hiring technicians? And are you doing anything on the, the recruitment marketing side? We are. I mean, it's something, that, there again, it's the same thing. I mean, you have to foster those relationships years in advance. Let's face it, the top level techs, your A techs, what I call unicorns that don't exist, you know, they, there's guys out there, but most, for the most part, they're pretty happy where they're at. You know, they've got a lot of tenure in these locations. So you've got to start building relationships with them ahead of time. 
and trying to get them convinced to come work at your store. And part of that comes down to environment. Like so many store owners don't think about what environment have you created for techs? Like why would a tech want to come work at your store? Out of all the places in town, everybody's hiring, right? Why do they want to come work for you? And if you don't know that and you haven't identified that, you're going to have a hard time selling it. We don't want you to give out all your secrets, but you know, one <laughs> or two things that you think of that say like, you know, for Mercs, here's why somebody wants to come work, work in this shop. A lot of it's environment. Uh, we've put a lot of, of time and money into the stores themselves. They're not dimly lit. I mean, that's a huge thing for techs. More than anybody can put their finger on. You know, we bought a store in Iowa that was a body shop, and we went through and replaced every single light in that place. And it, I never would have thought that I would have walked in there and been like, wow, this is a whole new building. It almost looks brand new. But they appreciate it, right? When you can see what you're doing, it's just more enjoyable. And that's part of it, too, making sure that you know, are people worrying about things like sound mitigation? You know, we have a store that we, we did a lot of research with and did sound mitigation where we put in to keep the noise level down because it is stressful. You know, if you think about it, a noisy environment, it's stressful. And uh, I think a lot of store managers and owners need to look at their reputation, not just uh, your Google reviews, but what do your technicians really think? Like uh, uh, they call it, uh, we do an ENPS, an Employee Net Promoter Score, how do they feel? Would they recommend us? Um, right. per, do you do something like that where you solicit their feedback on a regular basis? We do. Um, we don't do it as formally as that. It's probably a good idea to try that. Uh, we try to bring in and do quarterly reviews where we have a very informal sit down. Hey, how are things going? What do you need? What do we need to do better? Because I'm a firm believer nobody's going to sell your store to another mechanic better than their friend. Yeah. You know, it's word of mouth. Same yeah. way with customers. Yeah. You, you just can't beat word of mouth. Well, speaking of text, there was a couple of questions from earlier, from before the webinar that were submitted just around labor rates and, and price increases and how those translate into labor rates um, or into pay rates. But any, <clears throat> can you share anything about just your general philosophy on how you pay technicians, you know, stair step from when they start to, to how they continue to evolve? Well, it's really based on, on production numbers. I'll have technicians that'll come into the office and say, Hey, I need to make more money. And I can say, Hey, no problem. This is all you got to do. How much you want to make? Like you want to make 150 grand a year? No problem. This is what you need to do. It's already all spelled out. And, and that's one of the things I believe in about being up front. You get so many technicians you hire and you interview them like well why are you leaving well i was promised i was going to get a raise but then it never happened and they got busy and you know sometimes technicians you know they're timid they don't want to go to the boss and say hey where's my raise so being up front with that how they're going to make money and making sure that it's accurate you know and making sure that they feel that it's accurate and they understand where it comes from like our technicians they know before their paycheck they know exactly what it's going to be because it's on a scale yeah, so you're running a scale where I don't actually, if I want more money, I just look at the scale Let's and do perform. More well. I mean, I tell people it's a very, you know, symbiotic thing, if you will. If I make more money, you make more money, right? And so if if we're making more money, there's more money to share. And we're not real. I mean, I'll be honest. My style is not to be private about numbers. There are very few, other than individual personal salaries and some of the other expenses, they have all the numbers, we, you know, we're very uh, open about it so that they know and they know how they affect the numbers. Someone just asked, uh, how do you do that in a fleet company with hourly pay? Like have a stair step incentive plan with hourly pay. Um, I believe you have hourly pay, right? We do. And is it your, based on performance, your hourly rate goes up by several dollars per hour? So we look at it based on billables. Okay. So we look at it and we expect a set number of, of sales per tech per week. Right. And so we look at it from a standpoint of how much are you billing? Because at the end of the day, it's all about dollars, right? You can have a guy that looks like he's always busy and working his, his rear end off, but it's how much money does he bring in? And that's such a tool that's so easy. There's one little button you just push on full bay and you can see exactly what the revenue is per tech from that time period. If you weren't going to invoice, let's say that you were just working on private fleet and you were never going to invoice anyone, how would you measure them? Would you just convert that into a number of hours? Completed expect? hours. Completed hours. Right. Because at the end of the day, you know, efficiency is just a metric of completed hours versus clocked yeah, hours, right? Exactly. So really what we care about, it, we call it build hours, but it's completed hours. Yeah. Perfect. So you have to set a scale and say, you know, this is what we need. This is what we expect. When you hit these levels, this is your tier. And it really has to depend on what everyone's goal is. What is it you want from your employee? You know, how many employers actually sit down and say, 
you know, really spell it out. This is what we need you to do. This is how many hours we need you to accomplish. This is our acceptable comeback rate. These are, you know, you just have to have details. Everyone needs to know numbers. Yeah. And then you're not managed by feelings. That's a lot of probably a big pitfall of a lot of store owners is they start feeling that they're making money or they feel like they're doing good, but they don't have a, a, a value to put against it. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah, somewhat related to um, you know, pay rates, but I mentioned labor rates earlier. You know, where do you think we're going in 24 relative to continued price changes or price increases? And, and will that be in some way driven by the need to pay tax more just to be competitive in the broader market? Are you asking about, you know, how are we going to give pay increases or? Are you oh, no, like, do you, th do you think, you know, in 2023, especially early in 23, everyone was raising their prices. You had to, cause you couldn't, you had to pay tax more just to have anybody in the shop. Do you think that's eased off and, and you won't see as much of that in 24 or do you think you'll continue to see price? I changes? think it's just as aggressive as it's always been. Yeah. You know, it's there and there, you have to look at who you have. I mean, you have technicians that'll jump ship for $2 and you see it. They just, they leapfrog from store to store to store and they've been to every dealership in town. And um, so what I think the, the rates are going to increase. I do. Cause we have to be able to match inflation. We, we have to be able to try to keep up with that. And that's the big, you know, monkey on the back is can we increase rates uh, and revenue to keep up with inflation? So I think, I really think that those wages are going to keep going up because it's a resource that, let's face it, we're in a huge deficit of technicians. And it's not just uh, skilled technicians, it's any technicians. I mean, we've got more people retiring than we do coming into the industry. So I think those rates are going to keep going up. How do you push that out? Do you uh, share that information with your customers and then do increases or do you have to absorb those as expenses? Well, a lot of expenses that you incur, you're, you're always absorbing them in the short term unless you're really getting into aggressive marketing and you know aggressively looking at your numbers. Uh, but yeah, there's a certain amount of it that you have to just, you know, you have to just, that's the cost of doing business. And there's some people, and everybody knows it, sometimes you get a tech that you may end up overpaying him because you know he's going to be worth it tomorrow. And you have to look at that from a standpoint of investing in your employees. You know, sometimes you have to hire an employee that may not be the perfect guy, but he's got the right attitude. You know, if you, I'll take a guy with attitude and aptitude over raw talent any day. Hmm. Yeah, you can't teach attitude. Right. You can, <laughs> that is true. That's, there's a lot of documentation on it. So, so you, um, you don't necessarily increase your labor rates on a, a regular basis based on tech wages increasing. No. You'll look at, do you look at it from the economics and what the market's uh, uh, trending? How do you make a determination? Well, I mean, on? it's a lot of that. And some of it is you have, to, you have to know your market, right? You have to know what the market will bear. Yeah. And sometimes the market will bear more in some regions than others. And they'll, they'll bear more for certain services. Like take road service, for example. You, you know, you can always charge that at a premium. And... How much can you charge for that? Well, you need to keep track of your nose. And I'll be honest, if you don't get a couple of nose every once in a while, you're probably not trying hard enough. I mean, even from a sales standpoint, trying to sell a job or something like that. I mean, it's a real thing. Keep track of it. There again, it's back to numbers. If you don't know what your, your close rate is and you don't know how many times a customer says no and why they're saying no, how do you know how much you can charge? Yeah, that's a great point. I, I, that's the first time I've heard the way that you're talking about that is that sales funnel and that close rate's critical to know those defects that are happening to where you should pivot. Otherwise, you're guessing. Well, and you have to know your market. I mean, you have to be very honest with your customers. I've, I'm very blunt with customers, and I ask them, what do you have more of, time or money? I mean, you seriously have to have it done right now? That's fine. I'll have a guy work late. You know, you're going to pay more money. We'll overnight parts, pay air freight, you know, all these other things. But you can do a lot of things if, if they know how much it's going to cost. And don't always assume that this person doesn't want to spend the money. I mean, I've had mm. customers pay $1,400 to air freight parts overnight so we can put them on on a Saturday. And everybody else would say, oh, it's not worth it. It's only a $400 part. Well, you know, if a guy's got to get a load there on time, then he's got to get it there. Right. That makes sense. I got another question here. It says, since you're not flat rate, do you ever run into a situation where the tech feels like all his logged hours are billable, but office staff feels like they can't charge that amount. And then there's every, an example. Every day. Every day. <laughs> every day. You know what it is. I mean, it's a constant thing. It's they want to get as many hours as you can, and the, and the service advisors want to keep the cost as low as possible so they can sell the job. It's communication. You know, the technician is the only one that truly knows how long it takes. I, you can have all the theoretical times in the world, 
But if you don't know that he's working on a dump truck that's been upfitted and it's got 10 brackets in the way and two PTOs and all this stuff has been done to it, who really knows that? Yeah. So we put it back on the tech. We say, look, you quoted the job. Now, we're not say, asking him to go out and say this is a dollar amount. We're asking him to say this is how many hours I need to do the job. And it may not be the same for every tech. And that's one of the things that a lot of people have to get under the mindset of is just because this tech can do it in that time doesn't mean this tech over here can. And sometimes when you're quoting a job, you got to know who's going to do the work because it's going to affect the total cost. Yeah. I thought that the follow-up here was interesting. If you're basing wages on billed hours, how do you prevent techs from suggesting or performing repairs that customers don't need? Well, first of all, it's trust, yeah. right? Okay. you got to trust your employees. you got to have good employees that you can trust. And let's face it, you start knowing people. You know if you got this guy who's always going over the top, but it's a conversation because our service advisors, they pull the flat rate time. You know, they pull the book time. You know, there's they can use motor and find it or any of the other – uh, time things. So they'll pull the time and they'll look at it. And let's face it, if the guy comes back, sometimes it just comes down to justification. If you can justify it and you can explain to me why is this taking more time, then a lot of customers are okay with it. And you can sell the job. I guess at that point, if you're in the rust belt, anything goes. <laughs> it, just it just depends. depends. I mean, really I literally, hurts. I've worked on a, I remember one time we worked on a, uh, a plow truck. It was an old DOT plow truck the guy bought and we had to change the clutch in it. And there was nothing about that job. I mean, a normal 10-hour <laughs> clutch job was a three-day job because nothing was good. Everything broke. Nothing would come apart. And it's, that's why it's so critical. The technician has to tell you that. There's no way a service advisor sent in the office is going to know that this thing is rusty or this is going right. on or that's going on. Yeah. You have to lean on the tech. Yeah. Well, uh, someone's asking about comebacks. and You mentioned comebacks earlier, but what, what is an acceptable comeback rate? Like, What, what kind of goal do you well, think? It depends on the person. Have? You, you totally got a new, agree, right? right? You a got rookie. a newbie. You, you got a newbie that's yeah. that's uh, doing tires, and uh, not all comebacks are equal, mm. right? Some things are just, you know, oh, I forgot to put the the lug nut caps back on, and then you have other comebacks that are, you know, pretty horrific. So, um, I wouldn't say there is an acceptable rate. I think it's individualized. You have to look at the the person and their training, and honestly, you really got to look at what did you do as an organization. Like, what have you done to train this person? What have we done to make sure that they understand our process? Is our process documented, right? Is there a documented process that every lug nut has to be torqued with a torque wrench? Or are we just hoping a couple of uggas keeps it on? Right? You have to look at that from an organizational standpoint. Not all comebacks are the fault of the tech. Sometimes it really is the organization needs to really, you know, brush up on the way they do things. Yeah, that's a good point. And do the techs, just to clarify, do the techs do the work for free? You still got to pay them their hourly wage to right. do the repair. So they're not we have a store that's flat rate. Of course, that's they're not getting paid for. Okay. It. We have other stores that are hybrid where it's it's about 50% of their pay is going to be their hourly and 50% is going to be bonus. When they have a comeback, it's negative against the build hours that are figured into the bonus structure. But they're okay. still getting their hourly rate. So they've got to overcome that to get it back into good and the bonus. Correct. It will hurt them. Yeah. Correct. So there is a penalty. And you said, to clarify, 50-50 on the pay? 50. That's kind of the goal. The goal that, that's what I shoot for is a 50-50. Okay. I mean, of course, every time you hire someone, it's a negotiation. Right. So you're pushing numbers on a page. But that's kind of our goal is to be that 50-50 level. Got one around data. Do, do you export any data from Full Bay to then analyze separately? This person was asking about finding it very hard to analyze things in Excel, but do, do you do it? See, and that's the opposite. I find that's yeah. the easiest way. It really depends on how nitty gritty you, you want to get into it. You have to know what you're looking for. And I think one of the key factors for managers, is they have to know their numbers. What numbers do you want? And then how are you going to monitor them? If that makes sense. So if you have a, a target sales goal, right? And then you need to know what your growth, gross profit is on a job. Then those are the things you're monitoring. I mean, every single store manager needs to have what I believe is seven to 10 KPIs, key point indicators that this is what you're shooting for sales goals, you know, uh, gross profit, things like that. And you have to really look at those weekly. So you start seeing trends. Same with techs. I mean, you see a guy that, that usually is billing 40 hours a week and now all of a sudden he's billing 20 and 30. You know, you don't want to wait till the end of the month to find out what's going on with this guy. Yeah. You know, on data too, for anyone who's intimidated by it, if you download an Excel spreadsheet, uh, there's a function called a pivot table. It sounds scary, but it's worth YouTubing a video and just going through that. You can take a spreadsheet and with a couple of clicks, repackage the data to where it's sifted, sorted. You can see what components have the, the highest repair. You can see what units. You can, you can bundle it by cost per unit. So um, 
I was just recently at a, um, uh, um, one of our customers and the finance person was going through this exercise with a spreadsheet. It was about 30 minutes to 45 minutes a week that she was going through. And I said, hey, do you mind if I show you a pivot table? Ran her through a pivot table and reorganized the data in just less than five minutes. Yeah, that is one benefit of Fullbay over most other softwares is you're allowed to download any information you want for the most part into Excel and then we can sort it, right? You can sort it any way you want. And once you know what you're looking for, it's not hard to find. Yeah, I mean, I, typically I agree. I, I love Excel, um, but it's you know it's hard if you don't use it a lot. You know, that's something that that you know you can go online and probably take some. Free well, it's a good tool. I mean, I never would have thought. You know, I went to school to be a mechanic that I would spend most of my day looking at spreadsheets and using Excel, but I do. And it's back to that. You got to manage by numbers. You can't manage by feeling. You really truly have to manage by numbers. I mean, we did an exercise with the store managers where I said, okay, I want you to rank one to ten. Which technician you think bills the most dollars? Not who's the most efficient, not who you like the most, who bills the most dollars? There wasn't a single store manager that was right. Yeah. They really, wow. truly didn't know because they felt that this guy was productive. But even that, production doesn't always equate to dollars. It's interesting. We recently did that in one of the departments. We did the same exercise, and the data prevailed. If you're not looking at the data, you'll be misled by emotion or some feeling that you have. Um, what do you do during slow times? Someone had said, hey, if, if you know, basically if the, if the shop slows down, what do you do to, do you prevent it from happening or do you actually experience slow Well, there's weeks? no way to prevent it. it, it you're going to have a slow day. It's going to happen. You're going to have customers that don't come in when they're supposed to. You're going to have jobs that are waiting on parts and you just, you're at a standstill. What we do is we have a list. I have all the managers work on a list constantly with every technician. And this is what this person needs to work on. And this is how long this should take. So here's an example. Um, You've got a technician, maybe a newer guy. It's Friday afternoon, 3 o'clock. He goes home at 4. He's got an hour. Good. He needs to go work on his air brake certification, right? Mm -hmm. So we have that plan. So there isn't the downtime. Oh, that's smart because then that generates more revenue for right. the shop because he's air brake certified. Absolutely. Yeah. And as you think about training, your know, question back to maybe this is around recruiting or developing techs. Do you guys do anything around helping people go go back to school, get additional certifications that you pay for or give them bonuses we do. for doing? Uh, we'll pay for it. Uh, if they want to go certificate, we pay for ASEs. Uh, we'll help. We have a program where we can help pay for if they want to go get a, an actual like two-year degree uh, oh, at nice. a university. Do you require then, them to like commit back to you to stay for a period of time? We do. Yeah. Um, we, we usually ask for a two-year commitment. The other big thing we do is uh, we have a couple stores that every Wednesday morning for an hour is training. It's just a set thing. It's a known thing. Everybody shows up because it's always done. It's a given. And it's a huge investment in time. But at that store, every single technician is required to do 40 hours a year of continuing education. So not hard to get if you've every single week you're doing an hour. Yeah. And you're so paying them for that time. We're paying them for it. Yep. Yeah. That, and it varies terrific. on what it is. It may be, you know, one time you're working on, you know, fifth wheel maintenance. Another time it may be safety like forklift training or something else, but it's training every week. How, how do you, uh, manage? Um, so we, we talked about slow, but what about whip things that aren't closed? Do you, you, we reference like you're waiting on parts. You have things that aren't done, things that, you know, carry week to week. How do you manage whip? Are you looking at whip reports or, what, what are the key indicators that you look at? To well, the key thing is, is that we push it on our service advisors because they know what's really going on. They're the ones that talk to the customers. They're the no ones that know what the customer's need is, and they know uh, what the shop needs. We have a morning uh, morning meeting every morning with every single person in the store. It's usually about five minutes, and then that's a good opportunity for the technicians to talk to service advisors and vice versa and really iron out whatever problems they're going to have. But as far as monitoring uh, work in progress, it is absolutely based on your availability of parts and your availability of techs and bays. A lot of people don't think that way, but you got to schedule the bays. Hmm. you got to think about that. Now, uh, so from a technician standpoint, do you look at efficiency? Say that a technician's working, you've got a bunch of active jobs in the shop, and you want to find out, am I actually performing at the standard or am I below standard? Do you, do you ever look at efficiency while it's in WIP? Or after it's closed it's hard out. to judge that it's hard to judge yeah. efficiency on something that's work in progress because you don't really know are they really ninety percent I mean full bay is going to give you that the job itself is ninety percent complete based on how many action items are completed but to really know if you're giving a guy like an engine overhaul right forty hour job whatever it may be just because the guy's thirty hours in may not mean that he's ninety percent done right so that is very hard to do. Uh, it, it's critical there again that you have clear communication with the technician. He's got to tell you when there's a problem. He's got to tell you when he's ran into a roadblock. 
and so that you can articulate to the customer. Because, of course, that's always the phone call. It rings, and the customer wants to know, when's my truck going to be done? And, and everyone needs to communicate to get that. Is your proxy then the number of action items and how many have com- been completed on a whip? Is that the general proxy? And then you kind of drill in Really, the that? proxy is the technician telling us Just this is how much more time to, we yeah. need. It's yeah. all back to the tech. He's the only guy. I mean, he's the one doing the work. Because I don't, I, I don't hate anything worse than having a customer call and saying, oh, yeah, the guy's only got this left to do. And then come to find out, well, he really doesn't. You know, the, so it's, uh, you got to be careful with that. You know, you got to trust the tech. One person recently just asked, um, you know, if the tech's bidding the job, um, are, is the, you know, kind of what does a service writer do? Are they just beholden to the tech telling them how much time? No, it's a relationship. It, it, it's like, you know, whatever relationship, say, you have with a partner, right? It's not 100% one side or the other. It's a conversation. So maybe you're, I'm, I'm imagining uh, service writers, you know, putting together a job. Maybe it's going to be 10 hours. He's just verifying, hey, what does it look like right. to you? I, I've got an idea of what this is going to take. I'm writing it up. How does it look underneath there? And then the, the tech's like, hey, right. so far everything, this is a clean job. You can go by standard. Well, and the Something technician like puts notes in. So when the okay. technician does his diagnostic, <clears throat> okay. when he diagnoses it, he puts in the cause, he puts in the correction. Part of the correction is I need extra time because of X, Y, Z. I've got to have five extra hours because this is, you know, they put this bracket in here on this upfit and we can't take it out the standard way. And then, then the service advisor is able to articulate to the customer. So when the customer says, hey, why does this take 15 hours when the dealership said it takes five or whatever it might be, you've got that information, you know, the ammunition that you can give that to the customer. Yeah. That's Do you, is the bonus plan for a service advisor – uh, in line with that for a tech? Like, are, are, there, are there incentives aligned when it comes to billable hours? Uh, the tech, so the service advisors are getting paid off of total sales minus cost of parts because they don't really control parts. Plus, when you minus out the cost of parts, it heavily incentivizes the, tech, the service advisors not to discount parts because they have a vested interest. So we have a total payment plan system built, and it's not just individualized per person. It's store-wide. Every single person has a vested interest in their coworker doing their job. Parts, perfect example, right? Parts can't sell parts if technicians don't fix trucks. So you would usually think that the parts department has no concern over what's going on with the technician, but they do. Because the technician's not productive, they're not selling parts. And that impacts their pay. Correct. And is that the, you know, you mentioned a rule of 50-50, you strive for 50-50, is that the same for parts, service, management? Do, are they 50% variable and 50% base? That's, that's our goal is to try oh, to be that Oh, it's across way. the board. So if, that if is the goal. Writer, I'm not going to say it happens all the time because you have individual yeah, things that you negotiate. Course. But that is the, the goal. Well, then that would keep, if I were in parts, I would be absolutely aligned because half my pay is running on yes. this shop producing. It is. And so I would not hate techs. You're right. Same way with techs. You know, there again, techs can't fix trucks if they don't have parts. So if they don't do a good job of articulating the parts, you know, you can't just say, I want a widget. And that's the great thing about full bay, right? The guy (laughs) could be sitting there looking at a taillight on a truck. That's an upfitted truck, like a dump truck. It didn't leave the factory that way. Right. But you can put a picture on there. You could take that extra two seconds, do that little bit of extra work. And then now parts has got the part faster. Right. So now he can do more work and he's not, you know, pulling trucks in and out wasting his time. Yeah, that makes sense. Leveraging the tools. So it sounds like when you said you were investing in process and having a process, you, you're really going through the motions of trying to figure, leaning it out to where there's not a lot of rework, where it's something as simple as taking a photo of, of a part, a photo right. of a repair, writing specifically that you need more time in your service orders. Through the process, you're trying to get as much information as possible so that it smoothly executes. Well, and that's customer. why it's so important to document the process. We, when something goes wrong, whether it be customer service related or a truck not being fixed right, we literally sit down and go through the workflow chart. And I have them point out, where did we not do what we're supposed to? Oh, that's and probably awesome. 99% of the time, they'll point to a, an action item and be like, yeah, we just didn't do this. You know, either we didn't get the proper approval from the customer or we didn't, you know, uh, estimate it correctly. And it, and it really helps with accountability, which is key. I mean, you have to have accountability in your store. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, there's uh, one from John Hitch. Uh, Given that measuring promotes growth, is there a repair-related KPI you started measuring since 2024 that has stood out? Gross profit. <laughs> there 
Absolutely. GP, yeah. <laughs> because you'll get, you'll get people that constantly will tell you, you cannot get that. Yes, you can. Well, you can't, you know, you can't get margin on parts. Yes, you can. There are ways to do it. And yeah, it's hard sometimes. And it's back to sales, right? You got to have service advisors that believe in what they're doing. And that person on the other end of the phone needs to hear it. And is there anything tied to like SRTs or anything? Is there any other metrics that run the operations that since, you know, 2014 or whenever you've always measured this and it's paid off it's, it's, it's enabled GP. It's kind of held the test of time. There's two major ones. It's, it's margin on parts and it's uh, efficiency of techs. You know, we actually sit down and run a drill at the end of the quarter and look at total build hours versus clocked hours. And then I make the, the store managers rerun the numbers as if they were at a hundred percent. And then I have the technicians rerun their pay as if they were at a hundred percent. So they can see the real world impact of the efficiency on their paychecks. Oh, you're going through the exercise more than just talking Every about quarter. it. Every quarter. Wow. Yeah, that would make meaning. That would, t- that would have an impact big Well, because it's, it's all about, you know, you have to show what's in it for them. Like when you sit down and tell a technician, oh, you got to do a better job, what's in it for them? They got to see what's in it for them, and then they start buying in on it. Yeah, that makes sense. Well, it's probably got enough time for maybe two or three more questions. Yep. I'll reach out to Jim on Excel uh, with formatting. So I'll, uh, I think the Jim for you, the uh, pivot table is probably going to be key if that helps. And it says, uh, here's one 90% of the time or 90% of the jobs, the te- techs take too much time. How do we justify the extra time to compensate the tech? If we don't, uh, if we don't pay, he threatens to find another job. Well, there's a couple of things there, a couple of red flags on that comment. But if you're, <laughs> I was you're thinking your first it was going to be if you're ninety percent of the time you're <laughs> yeah. over, then we're not bidding the job right. All right, right, and just keep something yeah. in mind. Just because the tech's always over on time doesn't mean it's his fault. Yeah. If right. you bid the job wrong, if you if you say we're going to build a guy five hours, do a ten hour job, there's nothing that technician's ever going to do to make up right. for that. Why it's so key that the technician says this is what it takes. Plus, once the technician gets in that mindset, that technician now owns that, right? That's his decision that it takes 10 hours. So now he's accountable to that. It's about accountability. Yeah. As far as the guy who's wanting to quit, that's a whole other red flag that, you know, there's probably conversation needs to be had there. But <laughs> um, Let's see. Okay, so here's one. When working, on, working with fleets who use third-party fleet maintenance tracking uh, for approvals, um, how do you get the build time out of the work order that took longer than the SRT? Explanation. There's a certain percentage of that. I know what they're talking about. Someone like Hummel, Hummel or uh, uh, ARI. Uh, now it's Hummel uh, or Holman, excuse me. It's a conversation. It's the same way dealing with insurance companies. You know, you have to be able to justify it. Yeah. And, and you can justify things. And I'm not saying you're going to get 100%. And that is... You know, when you're dealing with those fleet maintenance companies, you are kind of fighting with one hand behind your back. But go into it knowing that. You know, go into it knowing that this is what the process is going to be and then, you know, tweak it so that it, it works for you. I wonder, you know, so we, we've seen this before where you do submit something to one of the brands and they say, you know, we only pay, you know, three hours for that. And you know it's going to take four hours. Is it... Um, do you end up sparring with them if explaining doesn't work? Or will you concede and just do the job for the I think three hours. That's kind of a, here's what I, what I tell people to deal with on that. You need to plan for the norm and deal with the exception, right? It's hard to make a, a one size fits all ruling. But if you know that normally there's a path you go down with dealing with these third party maintenance companies, and this is what they're always going to do. Then you find out it's like with insurance companies, but what else will they pay for? What right. will they pay for that? Maybe you're not billing them for, right? right. Like reevaluate shop supplies, and if they won't pay shop supplies, okay, that's fine. But they're going to pay you a dollar for a zip tie. Right. So you better bill out a lot of zip ties, right? right? So you just have to look at that and exploit what you're able to bill for. I've even seen folks uh, take the approach of there's a different hourly rate billed to one of those vendors, but that doesn't always work out. Sometimes it does. They are. Because, you know, you have ones that take 10% or right. whatever percentage they take, 4%, 10% off the top. So they just get billed a higher rate. Right. You know, pass the savings on to the customer. Right. That makes sense. Um, so there's someone who uses Holman. I'll leave out what he said, but uh, he's not happy. Let's put it that way. Um, 
Does anyone charge a fee if their customer is? Uh, does anyone charge a fee if their customer is using it? It costs us four percent to bill, so it's basically the four percent. Do they pass that on? Do you ever pass that on to your customer? Well, you always have to pass it on to your customer. Everything gets passed on the customer. You're going out of business. So how you pass it on? That goes back to sales. How can right. you sell it? Okay. Right? Can you sell a four percent credit card fee to all your customers? We've been able to. All right. And if you can't, then you have to roll it into shop supplies or whatever other expense you need to roll it into. You're not gonna you're not gonna lose margin over this. Uh, well, you're you gonna can't. Out, yeah. You're gonna go bank. You know, you're gonna go broke. You're trying to. You're yeah. You're staying in. Well, clearly you've been in business for a while. You've just merged with another group. You're larger. It's from these disciplines and this rigor. And I think you started off the conversation. You don't like uh, or earlier. You don't like discounting. Right. Um, <laughs> so. I mean, I'm not saying we don't run things like we do free DOTs. Yeah. You right. know, oh my God, you can't give those away. It cost me maybe twenty dollars to do it. And if you can't sell, you know, fifteen hundred or two thousand dollars of the work to a class eight truck on the road, you need to go back and look again. Because yeah. they all need something. Yeah, that's fair. And I'm not saying make it up, but they all need something. Right. Yeah, that is true. All right. Well, thanks everybody for the time, Peter. Thank you very much. That was great. Um, I mean, I think I took away a couple of these things from you. I mean, I love the the not discounting and you know being process oriented, measuring things. Um, so I think the audience is really going to love that. Um, thank you very much for coming down and seeing us. Um, for anybody that's not a full bay customer that's joining us, um, please let us know. We would love to show you uh, your know, demo. There's a lot you can take away from um, everything Peter went through that has nothing to do with full bay, but there's a lot that does have a lot to do with full bay. So we'd be happy to show you how we can help you um, kind of run a shop just as effectively as Peter does. So please let us know. And then one more plug for Diesel Connect. So I know you already signed up, didn't you? I think you were one of the first ones. So we look forward to seeing you back here in Phoenix here in three months. Um, but for anybody who hasn't signed up for Diesel Connect yet, we're doing it for the second time. Um, did the first one last year. Should be a great event. Um, we have lots of food this year. Yeah, that was good one of the food. complaints last year. <laughs> Not quite <laughs> enough meat. food. Yeah, it's going to be lots of food. We're doing it at the <laughs> Gila River Resort and Casino, I think. Yeah, yeah. there's going to be some gambling and all kinds of stuff. we got to, uh, some great speakers lined up. And you know, I think we'd, we'd expect to have you know, somewhere in the 300 to maybe 400 attendee range um, is the goal. So please get your tickets. There's a promo code round table. Uh, if you put that in, $50 off every ticket. So please visit the... Um, the show website, dieselconnectshow.com, and get registered. And we'll look forward to seeing you there in early May. And with that, we'll sign off and say thanks again, Peter. Thanks, Chris. Thanks for having me. Yeah. And uh, I guess a special plug, too. Uh, Peter just agreed to be a guest speaker at Diesel Connect. So you guys will meet him, and he'll have some material to present and uh, share more of what we talked about today. So I appreciate that. Look forward to it.